Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific, Admiral Edition, our Let's Play series against Evoken. We are returning to the June 9th turn of this game, so we are, you know, a ways in, no midway has happened yet, uh, but we are returning to the June 9th turn for the replay, and then I believe we'll be on to June 10th for the actual turn. Uh, we had a pretty big turn two turns ago, I think it was, when we bombarded Meaden and sank some Japanese shipping. Last turn, the Japanese unleashed their vengeance upon us with considerable amounts of submarine activity that sank several cargo ships and even one very valuable tanker. Uh, and we'll see what happens now. Um, I'm every day impressed by the bravery and the fortitude of those left behind in the Philippines, the fact that they are still holding out in Jan June of 1942, uh, where, like, not even just the Corregidor garrison, but the entire garrison has yet to surrender and have pushed the Japanese back to Clark Field, although they are now undoubtedly, you know, starving. So, not a lot going on so far. A little bit larger bombing attacks at Clark Field. But other than that, you know, maybe he'll be making an attack there soon. Our boys are pretty much out of supplies, so I would think he would attack soonish. No submarines in the PM phase, so that's good. Nothing so far in the AM phase either. Okay. Japanese are reconning Catherine, which is interesting. I wonder if they're going to make a Darwin raid. The thought hadn't really crossed my mind as a possibility until just now, but they're reconning past Darwin. Presumably to see what's at the airfields at Catherine. I think that's Catherine. Uh, just inland of Darwin, so maybe he's going to make a raid there. Any alternative histories that I would like or suggest? Um... I mean, the Aubrey Matron novels, the, uh, the Belitho novels are okay. That's more Age of Sail. So that's less alternate history and more of, like, historical fiction-ish. Like, the history doesn't change, but the main character gets inserted into it, kind of like Forrest Gump. These are both players. These are both players. Uh, it's... So the way this works, uh, Bah Hunt to me, is it's a WeGo system... So essentially, I issue my orders on my map, I send the turn to the Japanese, or actually the way it works is the Japanese player issues his orders, he sends a turn to me, I open the save, and I can only see what my part of the map looks like. I issue my orders, I send it back to him, and then when he opens the save, the game recognizes both characters have issued their orders, it's time to simultaneously resolve it, it generates a replay file, which he then sends to me, and so we can bo both watch the replay. You know, it's slightly different depending on Fog of War stuff. Um, but, but yeah. Alright, so pretty quiet turn. Not a lot going on there. Just your typical air raids and stuff. So let's go ahead and take a look. Actually, I, I didn't realize this, but apparently we got the Wasp. So, hell yeah, brothers. We got us a new carrier. The USS Wasp. With 27 F4F Wildcats, some 31 Dauntless Dive Bombers, and 9 Devastator Torpedo Bombers. They can carry up to 15 Devastators and 36 Dauntlesses and 27 Wildcats. A whole CV! But, I'll be honest, guys. The thing that makes me the happiest isn't getting the Wasp. No, no, no. The thing that makes me the happiest is we get the North Carolina, our first truly fast battleship. 16-inch guns, nine of them, three, four, six, four, three aft. Just look at that. Look at that beauty. Woo! Man. Battleships, they do it for me. Carriers are pretty, too, but battleships. Woo! Plus, we get another Atlanta-class anti-aircraft light cruiser. Those are always very nice to have. 
I'd rather they drop those stupid 1.1 inch AA guns, which they will do in November of next year for 40 millimeter Bofors, which are so much better. But uh, but I do love me the the North Carolina, the Wasp. Got a nice little task force there, so we'll go ahead and send these guys. They're arriving in the Panama Canal, you know, just on the in the Pacific side of the Panama Canal. So we're just going to go ahead and load these guys up. We're not load them up, but we're going to go ahead and set them up in a task force and just send them straight to Pearl so they can get into the action here, hopefully soon-ish. The other nice thing about them being new ships is they don't really have much in the way of upgrades that are needed either. So, But they will head straight to Pearl, and they will join the Hornet, which is already in the Pearl area. Hornet is operating between Palmyra and Baker Island as sort of a force in being. In the event the Japanese launch a raid on our uh, task force that is unloading troops and supplies at Baker Island, my plan was we'd use the Hornet to strike at them on their way out. Um, obviously, she's staying a good deal back in the event that the Japanese actually send carriers because I don't want to engage their carriers in a 1v1 situation or 6v1 or whatever it would be. Uh, but we do have we do have the Hornet chilling here, so that'll be the Hornet plus the Wasp. Um, and then also in about two, actually three weeks, we will get the... Lexington and Saratoga out of their refits. Um, and then we'll probably send them back to the Pacific as well, rather than operating in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have also sent... Where are they? Uh, are they not off the map yet? Yeah, we're also sending the Yorktown back to South Africa to join up with the Wasp and the Saratoga. So really we're working on concentrating our fleet so that it can it can all kind of reform in and around Pearl Harbor. Enterprise is somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. I thought I sent her back. I thought she was already here, actually. I don't know where I... Where is Enterprise? Let's just take a look. Task Force 16. Oh, so Enterprise is already on its way to the Panama Canal. We'll arrive in a week. So in in a week, we will have Enterprise at, at the Panama Canal and also on its way to Pearl. So we'll have three carriers in the Central Pacific pretty darn quick. So that's going on. We didn't really see a lot else going on. We do know the situation in the Philippines has got to be dire for the troops that are still here near Clark Field. You can see most of these soldiers are now starving. Some of them have a few biscuits and tins to eat, but very little. If they do, they attack us, we will fold like a wet blanket. The troops at Bataan, meanwhile, perfectly supplied. They got plenty of supply. 500 supply for the coastal defense units there and the base forces there so if he wanted to send you know battleships in to try and bombard us thinking that these boys would be starving out we'd have some nice 12 10 and 14 inch guns with plenty of ammo apparently to uh to greet them i wonder if it would be worthwhile trying to move them back would they draw supply off of these units so then they could have, you know, another, let's say they pull 100 from each that they could divide amongst these units. That wouldn't really do much, but be interesting. Because you get if you have 500 more supply here, you'd get them almost to one-tenth of the full supply. But it would probably consume more just to move them, and if they hit them in, mo if they hit them in motion, they'd, they'd get wrecked. So, the new CV group does not have any destroyer escorts. No, just destroyers. So, no DEs, just DDs. We do have a few DEs on the map, not many. Oh, more than I thought. We got a couple at Pearl. I wouldn't want to operate DEs with a carrier task force anyway. They're slower than regular DDs. They're shorter legged. DEs are meant for for convoy escort, really. So, but we do have a few of them doing a couple, you know, some mostly in at Perth it looks like. I can't remember if we converted these guys from four stackers. I think we did. These were American force stack destroyers that we converted to destroyer escorts. And they get much better as, uh, as anti-submarine units. You can see here they've got K-guns. So two triple depth charge mount K-guns here. 
in addition to the the DC rack. So the Clemson Destroyers are usually not as good. I don't know. Can I? I can't search. We could go to the database to compare. So if we were going to say, let's take a look at the DDs and then look at the classes here. So that we saw those had K guns and whatnot. If we were to go, oh my God, this is so, I wish you could just control F and then find a class. But if you look at the Clemson class here, they don't have K guns. This, those boys don't even have depth charges. That's, I don't think we were operating those. We're probably doing the 240. So they just have your standard DC rack. But as destroyer escorts, much more efficient ASW platforms. Actually, to that end, let's go ahead and form a ASW task force here. We know there's Japanese subs operating off of Perth because we lost a couple of ships out that way. So let's form a three-ship task force. These are all converted Clemsons. So we or basically we knew, hey, we've got these four stack destroyer escorts or destroyers. They're not very good destroyers. And it gives you an option if you want and you have shipyards available to go ahead and convert them to destroyer escorts to make them dedicated ASW platforms. And that's what I decided to do. I thought it made sense to do that. And uh, that's what we did. So we're going to send four destroyer escorts to Perth, and then they will operate against Japanese submarines in that area to try and see if we can keep those shipping lanes clear. Uh, meanwhile, they were doing a lot of recon over Catherine, which does have some aviation. It's got some long-range Hudson bombers, some dragons, some uh, 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 an unequipped DC squadron. What do the dragons do? Are those cargo ship planes yeah whatever um no real fighters or anything to speak of but these guys are sitting here so i'm curious about why he was reconning there maybe he was trying to see how many soldiers we have here we don't have that many we've got the fourth australian cavalry brigade probably the best unit there and then the third australian brigade which is decent and the Northwest Australian Base Force, which have a reasonable amount of AV, assault value. But then we also do have about a little less, about two-thirds of a division worth of assault value at Darwin itself. I think most of these guys are equipped with regular infantry now and not militia. They would have been mostly militia early on. We also have some coastal guns there. Uh, what are, What's the fortifications look like at Darwin now? Four? Almost to five, actually. Making pretty good progress there to five. Dock, load supplies. I don't. It's not going to make a difference, but we can try and rush 200 more supplies into Bataan. Maybe that'll help a little via sub-transport. It's not even ahistorical to do that. The Americans actually used submarines to transport like desperately needed anti-aircraft ammunition and to pull out sort of VIPs in... Uh, in the Philippines toward the end. Uh, so we can put maybe in about two weeks, 300 more supply into the Philippines, which is not going to do much. It might give enough supply to one division to operate for a few days, but you know, I am also deploying our British carriers, so we've got the Formidable and the Hermes that are actually on the way to do something here. Maybe give the Japanese a little bit of a shock, so we haven't been doing much with our carriers, but I'm sending this Task Force 9 with Formidable and then the CVL Hermes. The Hermes has had the American VMF, the Marine Squadron, F4F Wildcats, I got 20 of those on board. They are now carrier trained and capable because they've been on board for a while. Uh, but these guys are making their way to, and this is the max the carrier can carry is 20 aircraft. 
but they're on the way to with the formidable and it's 26 sea hurricanes and six albacores are on the way to off the coast of coast coast islands which the japanese keep hitting with two engine bombers we've got a couple of battalions of very good australian pioneer troops or at least they're well equipped um they're engineers and infantry at coast coast island which has you know it's not a very it's it's got three level level three forts it's on the way to level four and this garrison exists here entirely because this is in theory a base the japanese could put two engine bombers it's like air capacity two you could overstack to three and if the Japanese did put two engine bombers here, Bettys or Nels, they could effectively shut down my sea transport route between India and Australia. And so I deployed those troops there just in the hope that they would basically be a pain in the ass for the Japanese uh, and prevent them from, you know, easily shutting that, that route down. Christmas Island being further east is, uh, it would be annoying, but it wouldn't be as much of a risk. If they took Christmas, so I deployed two battalions to Coast Coast. Decent battalions, decent AVs, decent amount of fortifications. The Japanese could definitely take this base, but having lost at this point in the game, they're now far enough in that they've lost most of their amphibious benefits of landing. And so the thought is they'd have to deploy at least a couple of Marine units or maybe even like a regiment or a brigade to really for sure take the base. Um unless they just nuke it with battleships. But, uh, you know, it's also acting as a bit of a training base for Japanese bombers flying out of Palembang, presumably, or maybe Oosthaven, to keep hitting it, basically, their leisure. And so I'm I'm going to bring those those two small carriers down to hopefully, you know, maybe play a little bit of a surprise then. And then trailing them, I have another task force with the Illustrious and the Indomitable, um, as well as some American cruisers, as well as other British ones. Um, that are that are moving to Colombo just so they can be in a better position to potentially respond to any raid on the Bay of Bengal. I'm a little bit worried that my my bombing of Meden with our cruisers is going to prompt a Japanese response. Maybe they set a cruiser task force in here to try and mess with our shipping into Rangoon. And if they do that, I want to have my carriers a little bit closer so that they can provide support. Obviously, assuming the Japanese don't send the Kiribati. If they send the Kiribati... You know, all bets are off. We're not going to try and intervene on that. But um, that's the situation there. Rangoon's at almost 100,000 supply now. We've got three task forces unloading an additional 7,000 supply. Um, and then we also have more supply that is loading up in Calcutta. We're going to try and pump another 30,000 plus between those three convoys that are loading up into Rangoon and into Burma. I don't, I'm curious, guys, does, I don't know if anybody in the chat knows. What is this? So, like, this base has a, a supply limit, in theory, of 32,000 supply based on the fortification levels. But in parentheses, it says supply max 1,500. So, I don't know if these bases have special rules. Because if you go to a different base, like if you go to Rangoon, they don't have that limit. There's no theoretical limit here. And the base is large enough that there's no spoilage limit either so the way these rules work is generally speaking like if you put supply in last show it's got a level three airfield the level three airfield translates to thirty-two thousand supply of being able to be stored here without spoilage occurring if there's more than thirty-two thousand, then a considerable percentage of that will basically rot because the base is too small to effectively store that much but what i don't know is in a few handful of cases Last show, for example, 1,500 max supply. Does Chungking have a max? Chungking does not. Do other large cities in China? Other large cities in China don't, even if they're not very well built up. But it does seem like the, the route between Burma and China, most of these bases here have some kind of max supply called out. And I don't know if that's a spoilage limit or if that's a throughput limit like is it a maximum of 400 supply can move through that hex every turn or is it is there actually spoilage occurring if you exceed that amount i hope it's more of a throughput limit because my hope is to put so much supply in burma that it naturally draws supply into china because of the way supply moves over roads that would be the hope but i don't actually know those maxes would prevent me from i would ratchet this supply required up to draw more supplies into eastern Burma, 
which would then push more supply into China if I chain together the requirements at these bases correctly. But I don't, I've, I've still yet to, despite being playing this for many years, I still don't know what this max means. And I guess I haven't been paying close enough attention to really know, but um, yeah. Anyway, no real change in China. That's um, just kind of units hanging out, just waiting. Nothing really going on there. Uh, Rangoon is at level three forts. Should be at level four in the next few days. It's at 95%. Um, I'm also going to try and take Tevoy. Now, I don't know if he has any troops there. I don't really have much recon over here. But I'm going to send one brigade. The 46th Indian Brigade is going to move down to Tevoy to just try and be a pain in the ass, right? Like, we know the Japanese are going to threaten Burma. We know they will likely launch an assault on us. And we also know they may try to close the Andaman Sea. Well, one thing that'll make it easier for them to close the Andaman Sea, Tavoy is a level four airfield. And uh, that could be a really good base for him to put naval bombers at and push it further west. If I can take Tavoy back from him, that would be good for us. And so I'm going to send one brigade down here, also just frankly to see what's going on there. I'm not going to send troops into Thailand, as, as tempting as it would be, to try and move in and use the, the larger number of troops we have into Thailand. The game, I believe, if our troops enter Thailand, maybe it's Indochina, but I think it's Thailand. If our troops move into Thailand, I believe there's a special rule that gives him free new Thai divisions. Basically, it's a mobilization order. In the same way that if the Japanese advance south of, like, Rockhampton in Australia... There's sort of an emergency response where a bunch of Australian divisions show up in South Africa or in the Middle East with unrestricted HQs. It's supposed to represent, like, if Australia was being invaded, there would be an emergency to pull all the Australian troops out of Europe and send them to Australia to defend it. In that same sort of way, Thailand, I believe, raises troops if you invade it as the allies. Because Thailand is notionally independent fighting on the side of the Japanese. There are RTA divisions but I don't want to give them more, so I'm not going to invade Thailand, even though I think maybe we can make some progress there. Given the strength of our force at Mole Mine, which is over 1,500 AV, Rangoon is over 1,000 AV, we've got an additional you know, 100 to the east of Pegoy, or Pegu, uh, as well as another 150 in Pegu, and then we've got more troops that are kind of on the way or, or whatnot, or you know, available to us, so... Uh, that being said, also, we are in the process of unloading several American units in India. Hell is frozen over, and FDR has been totally chill with America sending troops directly to defend the British Empire, which, politically, this would never have happened. But we've got the 40th U.S. Infantry Division, for some reason, assigned to the 11th Fighter Command. I don't know why that's the HQ it's assigned to. I must have made a mistake when I un unlocked it. But, um, yeah, the 40th Infantry Division is unloading in India here. That's, you know, considerable number of per American personnel. Plus, uh, some of these other units here are also American. I think the uh, 501st Coastal Artillery, the 113th Base Force, um, also U.S. units. And then in addition to that, we also have already deployed the 27th Infantry Division and its 10,000-plus soldiers to India as well. So the U.S. has two full divisions in India now, plus support units. So we've got nobody at Calcutta yet, but we've got U.S. troops at Chittagong in the southwest corner of the Indian frontier here. Uh, the 223rd Field Artillery Battalion here with 105 millimeter howitzers. 10th U.S. Army Air Force Headquarters is also here. Um, the U.S. did deploy troops, I believe, to Burma, right? I think they deployed some special forces units. Not, And they definitely had aircraft flying in Burma and India to fly over the hump to bring supplies to to, uh, to China. But I don't think the U.S. ever deployed actual, like, full-blown infantry divisions that way. Um, and then we also have a, a brigade of infantry at Lido providing airfield security here, the, or the 53rd Regiment is also there, and then the 808th Engineering Battalion, so. But yeah, so that's what's going on there. Um, no real, no sign of the Japanese submarines, which torpedoes us off Perth, so look like the tankers 
that you know were on the way to Perth are going to make it there. They're one hex away, and uh, I don't want to do full refill. We'll do a do a minimal. But they're going to go in here, and we're going to bring seventy five thousand more fuel via this large tanker task force into Perth. So that'll be a nice chunk of fuel. Uh, which the Australian industry can either use or our shipping can use. That'll bring it over to a quarter million fuel at Perth. We're already unloading another 11,000 there right now. And then we've got 85,000 supply also on the way to Perth. Although Australia doesn't need supply right now. Um, if we go to Melbourne, you'll see Australia has 65,000 fuel at Melbourne, 8,000 supply. Sydney, however, has over 300,000 fuel and over 1 million supply. So Australia is pretty, pretty flush in terms of supply available there. Fuel's a little bit lower, and the reason I have to keep pumping fuel in is the Australian economy converts fuel to supply at their factories. So it does make sense to keep bringing in additional supply because it will chew through it even if you're not doing a lot of shipping. A Tortuga. But the draw limit, not storage. That would be great if it was the draw limit. Because being able to move even 150 extra supply every day on top of the 2,000 the Burma Road systematically brings in would be great. Um, so we already saw the Wasp in North Carolina arriving. We're also in the process of sending some convoys out. Task Force 187, 123, and was there one more around here somewhere? Well, that might be just it. But we're bringing those units out to replace some units that are going to be withdrawn. We're also bringing another 50,000 fuel almost here to Melbourne via these U.S. ships off the West Coast. Bringing another 40,000 fuel in this task force to Melbourne. And actually, yeah, it'll be basically 40,000. So another 100,000 fuel coming from the U.S. West Coast. I know it's, I, I've seen people say it's just more efficient to transport supply and don't worry about the fuel, but whatever. Um, I probably need to stop bombing a fate with our B-17s, right? So where are those guys? Ground targets. Select a target. We don't need to bomb a fate because it turns out there, I mean, we know there's enemy construction units there. doesn't seem like there's a ton of troops, but why don't we bomb... Espirito Santos. Maybe we'll see if there... I don't know if there's any enemy fighters around here. Um, and I guess one of the ways to find out is if we bomb Luganville to see if we'll get any enemy fighter aircraft up against us. I mean, these are not super well-trained crews, but it's not about the damage they're doing. It's more about just the intel that we're going to get from them attacking those bases. So we'll see. We'll shift some of those raids around. We have a very small number of bombers, so they're not consuming too much supply there. Meanwhile, we're trying to load up troops. The 8th Marines, these guys are 50% loaded up on this individual cargo ship, which means they've got almost 40 squads of rifle squads. But at the end of the day, we're trying to get the 8th Marines off of Savi and get them to, there's still quite a bit left. Uh, we're trying to get them over to Australia so they can... We don't have the dockyards to do it, or the, the the piers to do it. But we're trying to get them over to Australia so we can form the 2nd Marine Division there. Speaking of Marine Divisions, the 1st Marines are on the U.S. East Coast. Originally, I was going to deploy them to India as well, but that's probably overkill at this point. So I think we will bring the 1st uh, the Marine Division to Australia. So we'll have the 1st and 2nd Marines in Australia in, in a month or two. And then maybe we can be ready to start doing some offensives. I think my initial counter blows are going to focus in and around the Espirito Santos New Caledonia route. Feels a little bit like Tarawa in the sense of attacking a heavily fortified base, knowing the enemy's going to be strong there. But I really want to clean up my strategic line of communications and push the Japanese off that line. So at least neutralizing New Caledonia is part of that. I think the initial assault would be at Tana first, see if we can get take Tana. We can put a level five airfield here. We can transit planes in and out of Fiji to Tana pretty easily. And if we can get this base established, Tana would allow us to basically isolate and neutralize a fate, which we could then take. 
fate would effectively act as a leapfrog to Espirito Santos. Uh, and then if we take Espirito Santos, I mean, if we took these three bases, New Caledonia's dead. Like, there's no, there'd be no way for him to transport supplies to New Caledonia efficiently. Uh, the alternative is we could take Comac and Nomaya directly. That feels like that might be more bloody, but I really don't have a good sense of what's here yet. We've been doing some recon, and frankly, so far, it seems like not much. So maybe we don't need to worry. I don't know. I do also want to take Canton for the same sort of supply reasons, and Funafuti would be nice. I think Funafuti's unoccupied. And then after that, we'll probably start doing some McCarthy, or not McCarthy, oh my goodness, some MacArthur-esque, um, you know, pushing pushing north in a leapfrog manner. But I do think I need to clean those islands up first. And that would probably be where my priority is. Now, we didn't see a lot of activity this turn, so it was pretty quiet. I don't know that there's a lot else to show you. I don't think anything was sunk. Nope. Uh, ground withdrawals. We got a bunch of units that are going to withdraw in the next 21 days. Most of them are small. The biggest impact is the 19th, 19th Combat Engineers. Kind of sucks that these guys are going to withdraw out of the theater. It's a good unit. And they, they're on Penryn Island right now, which is sort of an anchor in our supply line between Hawaii and, and Pago Pago. I don't think there's any other important units. I guess the 752nd Tank Battalion... But they're attached to the West Coast HQ anyway, and I can't change, you know, I haven't changed that. Uh, 3rd Infantry Division is also going to, hey, my dad was in the 3rd for a while. 3rd uh, Infantry Division is also going to go to off-map, but they're currently West Coast. So again, not really something I'm too worried about. Some of these recce units at Darwin and Geraldton being withdrawn kind of sucks. Anything in Australia being pulled out of theater kind of sucks. And then uh, one of our armored units at... They've got Valentine's. Damn. Why are they pulling out at Rangoon? Machine gunners at Darwin. ABDA headquarters gets pulled out in October? That's interesting. I guess the headquarters historically was shut down. But... And then the first Philippine Corps goes away on December 1st if they haven't already been destroyed. But yeah. All right. Um, any new units coming on the line? Well, we just, we've got all the big ships this turn with the battleship North Carolina and the carrier Wasp. Uh, group reinforcement schedule. Five days we get some seagulls, some kitty hawks. Oh, we get the cruiser Quincy in five days. Hurricanes, Blenheims, Bolos in San Francisco in eight days. We get two more Marine Fighter Squadrons in Pearl in three weeks. That'll be nice. And then several B-17 Squadrons coming in as well. Oh, nice. In 23 days, we get 25 P-38E Lightnings in San Francisco. That'll be very nice to have. And then we get another... 75 of them in a month so we will start having much more capable aircraft arriving around that time very nice i'm still fighting a person i don't think you convert from person to ai i don't think the game lets you do that so that's going to do it for today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this most recent look at War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against Evoken. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.